All right, take your Bibles, if you would, please turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This time of the year, your Bible should open, right, to Luke chapter 2. We tend to spend a lot of time here. Before we get to the actual scripture reading, I need to explain why we're going to read what we're going to read in this chapter. I think you'll all agree with me that Christmas time, and by Christmas time, you're really talking about weeks and weeks, not just a day or two. Christmas seems to start even before Thanksgiving now. It starts as soon as Halloween is over, at least in our commercially driven uh, culture, but it really starts around the world. Um, weeks before it actually takes place on the Christian calendar for many societies and cultures, but it has turned into quite the spectacle, hasn't it? Christmas time, that being. I mean, the lights, the camera, the action, the advertising, the festivities, the traditions. For so many, so much goes into this day we call Christmas uh, that we celebrated this past week. For months and months, people will plan for those celebrations, for the gift exchanges. I mean, for crying out loud, I'm even thinking of next year's Christmas. I stopped at Home Depot and said, hey, now's the time to get a tree if you're going to get a tree, right? You should never buy an artificial tree before Christmas. You always go after Christmas because they're half off. Well, we have a new platform next Christmas. And this ain't going to cut it, folks. So we got an, a, a nine and a half footer for next year. But I got it when it was half off. I'm already thinking about Christmas next year. Don't worry. This will go in the new lobby. Those of you who are frugal and are worried we're going to waste this, we're going to have two Christmas trees. In the upstairs, we're going to have a little tree in the downstairs. We're going to be Christmas tree maniacs. But we think about it in the future. You're already thinking, where is it going to be next year? Whose house is it going to be at? We're always planning. In many ways, Christmas is that one event that we're always thinking about on some level. And so for weeks, people are busy going here and there, getting ready for Christmas. People have been spending lots and lots of money on the gifts and for the past few weeks and probably into the next few weeks, people will be going here and there celebrating Christmas, getting together with family, having the Christmas party for your family, for the in-laws, for the work party. There's all types of things we do. And I am one of those people that think Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. I, I really enjoy it, and many people do. You don't have to like it yourself, but I think most people do. But not only is it the most wonderful time of the year, it is the busiest time of the year. In fact, you're, you're, I was almost glad to hear how tired you look this morning and, and hear how tired you sound this morning. We started that first song, and I almost heard people like sigh, like, another Christmas carol. And we, we weren't, as a congregation, at all engaged today into that singing as we were last Sunday this time. You're only proving my point this morning, which is many of us hit a wall after Christmas. So much goes into December 25th and its surrounding festivities that when it comes and goes, and boy does it come and go. Moms, you know all the work you put into getting the presents for your kids, wrapping the gifts, the anxieties of, as to whether or not they'll like the gifts, and then you go through that at nighttime or the next day like, what just happened? I put all that work and money into, into that, and here we are, we're back to normal already, and there's, there's what a lot of people call in our culture a Christmas hangover, where you hit a wall after Christmas, you're exhausted, all the expectations for what you were giving and perhaps what you were getting and what you were making for dinner and all the people getting together, all those things come together, and afterwards you're just exhausted. Most people want to do little to nothing after the Christmas season. People who have uh, depression pro, uh, tendencies or even anxiety uh, tendencies, this is the hardest time of the year for people because it plays with our energy, with our emotions, with our expectations, our affections, and, and it's difficult for folks to get back into the swing of things after Christmas. Now let me apply that to the spiritual environment in which we're talking about this morning. I think there is a similar phenomenon connected to the Christian calendar. Leading up to Christmas, and we do it here, we talk so much about the opportunities that the Christmas season brings us. Folks, I will say, it's time to reach people with the gospel. Take the opportunity to tell people about Christmas, about Christ and beyond Christmas and Calvary and the resurrection. Tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
go and sing a carol because people accept it and it's a chance to herald the newborn king. We tell you to uh, think of someone in need and give to them. Buy presents for a needy family. We emphasize getting into church and celebrating together and singing together and ministering together. And so there's so much going on spiritually this time of the year that when Christmas comes and goes, there is also a spiritual Christmas hangover for many people. And I'd be lying if I couldn't tell you this morning that's what I see here. You're all like, let's move, move on. Let's get some rest. Let's stop with the cookies, enough of the singing, and let's just get a break from it all. That's why January tends to be the quietest, solemn, most solemn month of the year in, in our church's calendar because people are like, we don't want to do anything. We just want to sit in our homes with a blanket and escape the cold and escape all the activity for once. Why am I bringing this up? Well, I find it interesting, and I don't know how you'll take this this morning. I pray that something will, will perhaps be transferred to where my mind is at. The pianist asked me this morning, what song should we sing before the message? I said, I don't, I don't know. This is a weird message is exactly what I said to her. Because I don't really know how you're going to receive it. But I want you, if nothing else, think about why it is at the end of Luke chapter 2, and I, y'all look down like you're paying attention. I appreciate that. Uh, we're not reading this yet. <laughs> one, of the, one of the best things about me growing up in this church is I feel like I know you before you, before you do it. Because I have been where you are for most of my life. And I do it all the time when the preacher says, in Philippians chapter 1, Pastor Phil, you look down because you're not paying attention. Like, that's a moment for you to, oh, we're, we're in the message now. you got to pay attention. We're in Luke chapter 2, and you re-engage. That's why you come down here, because it re-engages you. As soon as I get up there, you just, you know, wander, <laughs> wander. So I'm going to go back up. Pay attention, pay attention. In Luke chapter 2, don't look down. We're not going to read yet. There are 13 verses that we're going to read. I'll tell you when to look down and follow along. We're going to read these verses, but I've never and I'm sure they've been done, but I've never heard them read with the Christmas story. Now, there are four chapters in the Bible that tell us the Christmas story. Matthew chapter 1, briefly at the end of that chapter, and Matthew chapter 2. Those two chapters are given to the birth of Christ and to the very early months, maybe some years, but early months of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 1 is all about the, uh, the, the baby John the Baptist being born, Mary giving the news about being pregnant. Luke chapter 2 tells us all about the birth of Christ, the shepherds seeing the angels, the shepherds seeing the baby, the shepherds telling the townspeople in Bethlehem, Jesus and Mary taking Jesus to the temple where he would be circumcised, dedicated, given his name. Simeon and, and Anna meet Jesus there. But those are the only two chapters. Matthew chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and John chapter 1 all start with the ministry of Jesus Christ, which would be about 30 years of age. So the majority of the Gospels, the entire Scriptures, when it comes to speaking about Jesus, the majority of Scriptures given to the ministry of Christ, to the death of Christ, to the resurrection of Christ, to the ascension of Christ, and eventually to the kingdom of Christ. Just a little sliver of Scripture is given to the birth of Christ. You know that childhood in between birth and ministry of Christ, which is the majority of Jesus' life, that 1 to 29? The Bible almost tells us nothing about it. However, in Luke chapter 2, we get to read about the childhood of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. It's not Luke chapter 3. It's not a separate part of Scripture that's supposed to be read uh, away from the birth of Christ. Luke chapter 2 has been designed, I believe, by the inspiration and preservation of God Almighty in our Bibles to be read together with the birth of Christ, meaning we should read about the birth of Christ, the dedication of Christ in the temple, and continue to read about the childhood of Jesus Christ before jumping into the ministry of Christ. Yet, Christmas time, at least in the Christian calendar and, and what we tend to celebrate as a Christian community, never includes the childhood of Jesus Christ. So let's read it, and then I'm going to make a suggestion as to why 
uh, why I think it's included in the birth of Christ. And it's nothing deep, so don't expect anything deep. It's going to be very practical. I hope to help you this week, if no other week, in the, uh, in the year. So here we go. Verse 39. This is after Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. This is after Jerusalem, where Jesus was dedicated. We go into another city called Nazareth, and then we'll come back to Jerusalem. Verse 39, Luke chapter 2. This is just, just, just after all the details about Christ's birth. And in verse 39 that we read this, And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they, Mary, Joseph, and the baby, returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And verse 40, And the child, that's Jesus, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, <clears throat> filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and then they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance." And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. I think that was panicking, seeking him. Verse 46, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy mother and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Which, by the way, I thought about this reading the passage I don't think this is the case, but if Joseph was the carpenter we believe he was, and if he had his own business, that would have been a strange statement. Was she not? I should be about my father's business? We read it with a capital F there, but maybe they thought he was talking about Joseph's business. Probably not. Either way, verse 50, And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them, verse 51, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. What we have just read is the only passage in the entire canon of Scripture that gives us any insight into the years between the first few years of his life and the final few years of Christ's life. These verses are the only pictures of Christ's childhood in the photo album of his life. Why is there so little? Now, I don't know the answer to that question. I can only suspect, and although I, I think it's a good uh, suspicion, but as the Jewish Messiah... Jesus' life would have been in jeopardy had he been exposed as the Messiah that early. You say, well, he was. He was by the shepherds. He was by the wise men. There was an, an indication that he was the Christ. But that disappeared, number one, in Egypt when he fled from Herod. But it disappeared during his childhood. There's no talk about Jesus being the Messiah. Even when he shows up on the scene at the age of 30, there still isn't, oh, there's Jesus the Christ, right? No one knew that essentially he was the Messiah until John the Baptist identified him as such. And even then, it wasn't until he did miracles that they began to potentially believe he was the Messiah. There was incredible skepticism about Jesus from the beginning to the end. But had he been identified by all as the Jewish Messiah as a little child throughout his entire childhood, his life would have been in jeopardy given the Roman rule that was over him. And so it is most likely that Jesus masked his divinity while a child, while a teen, so as to avoid detection by the masses. His own siblings didn't buy into his messiahship, which meant 
he was a very common child, a very average child. He didn't do all the things that we would suspect a Messiah, a Christ, the Son of God, to do. So, why would God include this story into the Bible at all? Why include it in Luke chapter 2, right after the miraculous, glorious birth of Jesus Christ? Why go uh, from birth to childhood, then to ministry? Why not just go from miraculous birth to ministry of miracles? Why not go from shepherds to apostles, Bethlehem to Calvary, manger to cross, virgin birth to empty tomb, empty tomb, skip all of his childhood, skip all of his adolescence altogether, and not even mention this encounter where Jesus stayed in Jerusalem and the parents took off without him. I imagine we'll find out why God put these 13 verses in Luke 2. I imagine there's multiple reasons why God included it in the, in the Scripture. He is beyond our intelligence, beyond our comprehension. God has a purpose for everything. He has a reason for everything He does. Uh, there are things in the Scriptures we cannot begin to imagine. So I'm sure He has a very, intent, a very good intent for it. But I'd like to make a simple but I hope relevant application to all of us this morning as to why mention the childhood, the adolescence, the 12-year age of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2. And it's the title this morning. With Christ, there is life after Christmas. For the Christian, there should be life after Christmas. Christmas. Now, doctrinally, spiritually speaking, when we become born again, when we become a child of God, there is more to our life, or there should be more to our Christian life than just our new birth and our eventual resurrection. There should be more to our Christian life than just being born into the kingdom of God and then eventually going to heaven. There should be a lot that happens in between. And with Jesus, there was a lot that happened in between his miraculous birth and his miraculous resurrection. And Jesus gave us, or God just gave us a little snippet into his childhood, even when he was 12, to let us know that. He wasn't insignificant. It, didn't, it wasn't a period of ultimate silence. There were things happening where Jesus was still busy about his father's business. But applying it to this time of the year, to this week, to the coming weeks, there should be life, spiritually speaking, after Christmas. All of the hoopla, all of the excitement, all of the activity that takes place during December should not cease to exist on December 26th. And even though we're all tired, even though we're exhausted, even though we're potentially worn out from all the things happening, we cannot afford to sit back and think it's okay to just, you know what? Christmas is over, we can take a spiritual break from our Christianity. Now, that's not at all the intention, I believe, of God during uh, any time of the year, but also this time of the year. Understand that Christmas isn't the climax of the Christian calendar. It really is only the beginning. We celebrate the beginning of Christ, the beginning of Christianity, but we gotta get to we gotta get to, to April when we celebrate the real climax of Christianity, the resurrection. And like Christ's life, it's not supposed to be just a period of silence between January and April or January and March or December and March. We should be busy about our father's business as Jesus was busy about his father's business. We have emphasized the spiritual for the past month, and you have responded well. The attendance in church has been, uh, has been good. The activity outside of church has been good. The spiritual sensitivity, the spiritual and, uh, emphasis has been good, in my opinion. It's been a very good month, has it not? But our emphasis on the spiritual at Christmas time cannot end on December 26th. Giving shouldn't end when the Christmas tree no longer has any gifts beneath it. Worship shouldn't end when the Christmas Eve service is over. Celebrating Christ shouldn't end when the nativity scenes are boxed up and packed away. Loving one another with a sense of simplicity, a sense of authenticity shouldn't end when the get-togethers are completed. Just as there was life for Christ after His birth, there should be spiritual life for us after Christmas. So what am I saying this morning? I hope if nothing else you get the point that don't let a spiritual Christmas hangover infect your hearts. Don't think because you got through it, 
You did your duty. You spent your time. You spent your money on everything you thought you should. Don't think that you can just let your hair down spiritually and coast for a while. It's a dangerous time to do that. Don't let the end of Christmas end your spiritual efforts and your spiritual emphasis. So I want to look at this passage uh, probably just look at the first thing more than the rest of them in detail. But I want to mention some things that we see in the childhood of Jesus that we should pursue, we should be maybe confronted with this morning and hopefully uh, carry the spiritual emphasis through the next few weeks and months. But number one, we'll notice perhaps the most ironic thing in this passage that we should focus on, and that is this, stay in the house of God. Now, I, I really feel because I know God is an amazing God and He has the foreknowledge uh, of, to know everything, I really feel like this story was chosen with human tendencies in mind that would be so relevant hundreds and thousands of years after it was written. I want you to think with me. There's one thing God told us about Jesus' childhood. One thing. You know what I wish He would have told us? I wish you would have told us how nobody ever got Jesus out in dodgeball. <laughs> I, I am, are you not fascinated with the life of Christ as a child? It blows my mind how he could be subject to his parents. It blows my mind how he could wear a diaper. It blows my mind how he could sit in a bathtub and let his mom wash him. It blows my mind that he's burping, right, that he's throwing up. It blows my mind the Son of God is learning to walk. You're like, this is ridiculous. I mean, can you not put yourself in the mind of Christ inside that body? Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> That's what these creatures do. They can't figure out how to walk. Now, why couldn't God tell us that everything he ate, he magically turned into candy or something in his mouth, right? <laughs> Eat your broccoli, mm, and as it goes in his mouth, it turns to M&Ms or something. And it, He can do that. Or Jesus has a kid, you know, I'm going to, my, I'm going to Billy's, I'm going to, I'm going to Jeshua, I'm going to somebody's house, and, and he takes a shortcut. He goes right over the creek, walks on water. Like, <laughs> that's the image I have of this child. And of all the things that God tells us about the child, it's not a miracle he does, it's not how perfect he was, it's not how wonderful he was as a child, it's the story about how mom and dad take their whole family to Jerusalem once a year. And once a year they celebrate the oldest and most principal service in Judaism, which is Passover. Once a year... Everybody gets dressed up, they make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and they celebrate the Passover, and when it's done, they go home. <clears throat> I hope you're picking up on what I'm trying to put down. Here we are in 20, almost 2020, 2019. What is that one day of the year that within Christianity, almost every Christian or every person who claims to be a Christian or every person who almost wants to be a Christian does on December 25th or December 24th or maybe December 22nd, they get dressed up, they get their family together, and they go to church. Even in this church where our attendance doesn't spike incredibly high for Easter or Christmas because you're faithful, you're here most of the time, and I thank you for that. But you know, last week we were almost at 300 last week. 296. Yes, that's the highest service we had in 2019. I looked back, 2018, Highest service was Christmas. 2017, highest service was Christmas. Christmas and Easter, they say. Christians go to church, right? So here we are. One story that God gives us about Jesus' childhood. One story. And it's about Jesus staying in Jerusalem when his parents go back to go home. And it takes the parents a few days to find him, and they come back. What did Jesus get his parents to do? He got his parents to come back to church after Passover. You know what you need to do? You know what I need to do? You know what the Christian community needs to do after Christmas where they think it's that climax of Christianity where we put all of our spiritual eggs in one basket and we celebrate and we get all excited? You need to come back to church the following Sunday. You need to stay in church from here on forth. You know, a lot of people don't go to church for all different types of reasons. Some people have to work. They have jobs that legitimately require them to be there. I think of nurses, doctors, policemen, jobs that 
You can't get around that Sunday. There are jobs that you don't have to work on Sunday, but you still work them. But some people don't come to church because they're working. Some people don't come to church because they're working at home. Some people don't come to church because they're doing side jobs. Some people don't work because they're sleeping because they're so tired from working. Some people don't come to church because they have sport events to take their kids to or coach or be a participant of. Some people don't come to church because they don't like the person that sits next to them. And in Baptist circles, you pay for your pew rental if you haven't done that. Good luck in the new auditorium, by the way. 22 seats wide. So we're taking donors right now for the two end seats on either side. <laughs> but some people don't come to church because the anxieties of all the people. Some people don't come to church because they don't like the pastor. Some people come, don't come to church because they don't like the music. There's a lot of reasons people don't come to church. But here's what I find fascinating. Most believers, most Christians, most people who think they're Christians or want to be Christians, who are interested in being a Christian, most of those people on December 25th or 24th or 22nd, whatever that Christmas service ends up being, most of those people, they don't mind those excuses that day. Meaning, we got to be in church. It's Christmas. We're not going to go to work. We're not going to sleep in. We're not going to go to the ball game. We're not going to stay at home because we have things to do. We're not going to let the person on the other side of the aisle bother us. We're, we're going to get past that annoying pastor. We're not going to care if he brings up you know, marriage and husbands and wives on Christmas morning. We're not going to care about all these things. We're going to go to church because it's Christmas and that's what we should do. Which I'm glad. And I saw people last week I haven't seen in a while. And I was thrilled to see them. But can I point out the obvious, please, for the sake of your spirituality, for your growth? If you can make church a priority on Christmas, then you can make church a priority the following Sunday. If you can ignore all the excuses on December 25th or 24th or 23rd or 22nd, then you can ignore all the excuses on December 29th and every Sunday of the rest of your life. If you came to Christmas service, I'm super duper happy you did. I think you should be back the following Sunday and the following Sunday. Why? Because Jesus' life didn't stop with the birth of Christ. It kept going. He didn't stop doing the will of the Father by being born of a virgin. He kept doing the will of the Father, and he decided to stay in church when he didn't have to. He decided to come to church when he didn't have to be there. He went into the Jewish temple and sat down with the doctors and understood them, asked questions, and reasoned with them. And in so doing, he was trying to essentially grow his, his faith, if you want to put it in human terms terms and he got his parents to come to church by staying in church i love that story you're here i feel bad because the people who came to christmas service are not here maybe and hopefully you're listening on the stream but <laughs> probably not i talked last week briefly in a very busy service about doing what mary did making a scene letting jesus come out of our lives, if you recall that. Mary gave birth to Jesus, and Jesus then was adored. People saw him, he was worshipped, and he brought hope to Simeon, to Anna, excitement to the shepherds, and so on and so forth. Well, I'm telling you, if you let Jesus come out of your life, if you let Jesus come out through you, he will bring you back to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, if you are physically able to be here because Jesus Christ, it's his tendency to stay in the temple, learning and being in the midst of the scriptures being discussed. And when Jesus, or when Joseph and Mary said to Jesus, what are you doing here? You made us so afraid. I can't believe you're still in the temple. We can be home now. We got excused from from the service, and Jesus said to them, did you not know? Did you not know I have to be about my father's business? Jesus asked the question, almost perplexed, like, why would you even question that? Why, why, why is it strange to you, mom and dad, that I'm in the temple spending time in scriptures? And so, too, if you let Jesus come out, if you let Jesus rule your life, live your life for you, he will bring you back to church time and time again because this is the place he wants you to be in because this is the place he wants to be in. If you gave him the excuse, well, you know, Jesus inside of you is saying, hey, let's go to church, boy. And you say, no, uh, I've got things to do around the house. Jesus is going to say, what? 
Wished ye not that I got to be about my father's business? You're going to keep me at home when I should be in my father's house? And any excuse we throw out at Jesus inside of us, the still small voice is going to say, Know ye not that God will be busy about my father's business? Now is not the time to be spending, investing in all these materialistic things and these temporary things. Sports are good. Sports are, I think, excellent. I was all about sports as a young pe person. I've got my kids in them. They teach you a lot of lessons. But sports are not what we should be doing Sunday morning. Jesus says, we've got to be about our father's business. And the doors are open. Let's get there. Let's learn about God, let's learn about the scriptures, amen? I think what we'll do is just point out a few, th a few other things, but if you get nothing else, get that the story of Jesus as a 12-year-old staying in the temple, immediately told to us after the story of his birth, I believe is intentional so that we realize there's more to our faith, there's more to our Christian lives than just the birth and the resurrection. More than just Christ being born and Christ resurrecting. More than us being born. More than us being resurrected. More than us celebrating Christmas and Easter. There is a period of time in between that we should be busy about our Father's business. And it starts, number one, with staying in the house of God. Come to church on Christmas. Absolutely. Join us on Christmas Eve. It's a wonderful service. But come back the following Sunday. And then come back the following Sunday. Number two, we note in verse number 52 that Jesus increases in wisdom. Jesus increased in wisdom. Be careful of that Christmas hangover, Christian. Be careful to fall into that post-holiday burnout where you slack off on your spiritual disciplines. Stay in the house of God. Why? So you can hear the word of God. Why? So that you can increase in the wisdom of God. Keep reading your Bible. How many of you have slacked off these past few days? Probably most of us. Because we have to quickly get the meals made, the packages wrapped, the, the places to go. And we tend to put things off. You put off the Word of God. You're denying yourself the wisdom of God. This time of the year, as, as at any time of the year, we cannot afford to go without the Word of God. We cannot afford to go without the wisdom of God. Maybe you've noticed this, but I have found that people are more attentive to spiritual things during the Christmas season. And almost immediately after the Christmas season is over, we as a society, we return to normal. Don't we? Don't bring up Christ. Like, Christ is welcome for about a month. And then as soon as the new year hits, whoa, 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 whoa. PC. Politically correct, right? You can't bring that up. People are open. They're spiritually sensitive. They're spiritually fertile during Christmas season, but right after that, mm -mm, we're back to that cold vill. We're back to that hard, that hard ground. We in, a, in the church can be guilty of doing the same thing by returning to what we would call our normal routine and putting God back on the shelf. Let us not allow that into our lives. Let's not put the, the spiritual gears back into neutral because we've gotten through the Christmas season. Let's not put the spiritual sleeping mask on and go to sleep because Christmas is over. Increase in the wisdom of God. Listen, I know you're tired. I know you're worn out. I know a lot has been going on. I know a lot of activities have kept you busy. But we must continue to increase our wisdom. Now, how many of you would agree with me? A wise child is not the same as a wise adult. Would you agree with me on that? To encourage you to stay awake. If you all agree with that, say amen. amen. All right, if you disagree with that, say, oh, me. We're good. We're on the same page. How many of you agree with me this? A wise father is not the same as a wise grandfather. Yeah. You can be a wise kiddo. You can be a wise adult. You can be a wise dad. You can be a wise grandfather. But they're different from each other because you're at different stages of life, meaning you need to keep getting wisdom through every stage of life. Listen, I'm asking God for wisdom every day, but you know the wisdom God's going to give me pertains to my life. At this stage of my life, I don't need nor am I seeking the wisdom that comes with necessarily the, the infirmities of old age. God has given me wisdom to raise my children. But as I grow, I'm going to need more and more wisdom. I'm going to need to increase in wisdom that will pertain to the phase in which I am living. And so we have to keep increasing our wisdom. Stay in the house of God for the rest of the year. Stay in the house of God so that you can increase 
the wisdom of God. Number three, I'd encourage you to rise in influence for God. Look at verse 52 again. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Now, stature does have to do with height. Uh, Zacchaeus was of little stature. So Jesus was growing in height naturally as he grew in age, but that's not what this is referring to. This is referring to uh, importance, influence. Men of stature, men of great stature are those who have great importance, great influence in a society. Politicians are men of stature because they can influence law. They can, they can influence a country, a community. And so Jesus Christ... He consistently grew in wisdom. He consistently grew in importance, in influence. And applied to our life after Christmas, applied to our time of the year. I'd encourage us all to be conscious of God's desire for us to rise in influence for His kingdom. You know that, that evangelistic push that we encouraged over the past few weeks, giving out Christmas gospel tracts? giving out Christmas cookies with a, a gospel track, uh, going and caroling and giving out Christmas bags to tell people about Jesus. Remember all that? Don't let that die because Thanksgiving is over. Don't let your influence on the souls of men and on the souls of women die because Christmas is over. I'm not suggesting you take Christmas cookies you know, in April to somebody and give them a Christmas track. That may come across a little strange. But I am suggesting that you continue to look for opportunities to be influential, to, to rise in stature. Not, not importance from a, look at me, how important I am. But to rise in importance within the kingdom of God. So that when God looks down and sees all of his, all of his uh, children, all of his soldiers, all the, all the people in his kingdom, he says, ooh, ooh, that one is very important. They have a high stature in the kingdom. That one is influential. That man I've got to put in a position where he can reach people. That woman is, is, is of importance and an influence to people. Look for opportunities to be an, of, of a positive influence beyond the Christmas season. Moms and dads, real quick, let me just tell you this. You may not even know you did it, but when you bought all those gifts and you put all the thought into what you bought for your children and you wrapped them up and you approached that tree on Christmas morning and you just were so excited to see your kids open their presents, you wanted your kids to love you for that. No, no, I wanted them to be happy. You wanted them to love you for that. That's human nature. And that's, that's good, by the way. You should want your kids to love you. You should want your kids to look at you and say, Oh, Mom, you're the best ever. Thank you so much. You want the kids to say, Dad, I wanted this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You should want that. So that you can have a, have a tremendous impact on your children as they develop. But, you knew the but was coming. Of all the gifts you gave your kids... None of those gifts will influence your children the way you as a person can influence them. People try to buy their kids. It doesn't work. Buying their kids only spoils them. Now, if you give them gifts to show them you love them, that's a different story, but you've got to do more than just Christmas morning. You've got to invest time in them. And if you invest time into your children, if you, if you are uh, consistent with your discipline, if you convince them that you're training them because you want them to succeed in life, because you want them to inherit the blessings of God, you will rise in stature in the eyes and ears of your children. And all the, the, the hours you spent combing uh, the internet for sales on their special present, of all the hours you spent wrapping them, of all the hours you worked to buy those gifts, Take that amount of time and pour it into your children so that you can influence them far beyond December 25th. Because nobody will be more influential in the life of a human being than a mom or dad. Period. You and I, moms and dads, have the greatest potential to change a life for their entire lifetime. It goes beyond Christmas. You didn't do your duty. Moms and dads feel bad if they don't give their kids a lot of stuff. Hey, you've got 364 days to love on your kids and to make a difference in their lives. They forgot what you gave them already. They're already looking forward to their birthday presents. They're already getting their list for next year. Kids are ungrateful by human nature. They don't want, they don't want what they have. They want what they don't have. Give them something that they won't know they have until they grow up. 
And that is a mom and a dad who changed their life from the inside out. Not because of what they put on their back, but because of what they put in their heart. Rise in stature. And then number four, don't take a break. I know you're tired. I know you're tuckered out. I know you're worn out. I know Christmas is just about over, but don't take a break. I'd encourage you to grow in favor with God. Verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God. And man, that's all we know about Jesus' childhood, that he tarried in Jerusalem, that when mom and dad came looking for me, he said, Hey, wish you not that I must be about my father's business. And we read that he, as a child, he grew in wisdom, he grew in stature and importance, and he grew in favor with God and in favor with man. This young child would grow into somebody that God loved and found favor more and more every day. Christmas time, I do believe, brings God a lot of cheer. A lot of Christians do take a, take a little time out from the busy schedules of everything else, and they do give more to people in need. They do give more love to people. I think Christmas is, is a time where a lot of people set aside those petty problems throughout the rest of the year. They're, they're, they work harder at making the relationships with difficult siblings work. They work harder during the holidays to make their marriage uh, peaceful. They work harder during the holidays to set aside the selfishness and be more giving. They work harder at trying to tell somebody about Jesus Christ during Christmas time. And I think that brings, brings a smile to God's face. I do. But then January hits. And we go right back into what we do all year long, which is not a whole lot. And we read that certainly God was ecstatic with the birth of his son, the virgin birth of his son, and he, he was obedient to the will of God to come. But he didn't stop there. He kept doing the will of God and getting the favor of God, and it grew. He didn't just have it. He gained more of it. He increased in favor with God and man. So what am I saying? Very simply, don't stop giving just because Christmas is over. Don't take that spirit of jealousy and put it in a jar and put the cover on it and put it on the shelf till next Christmas time. Don't stop looking for folks that you can be a blessing to. Don't stop trying to make your marriage work. Don't stop trying to make your relationship with your difficult sibling work. Don't stop uh, forgiving the offender, loving the unlovable, celebrating the Savior, and embracing the cross that God has given to you. Again, I know you're exhausted but don't stop earning the favor of God. That's all I wanted to talk about this morning, Luke chapter 2. The whole Christmas story doesn't stop when Jesus went to Egypt with Joseph and Mary. The Christmas story continues to tell us about Jesus as a child. And so celebrate Christmas by continuing the story, by continuing to place an emphasis on the spiritual. And don't take your foot off the accelerator. Keep growing. Keep growing in wisdom and influence and in favor. And you do that more than any way. You do that by staying in the house of God. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock. We've got our final homegrown uh, homiletic preacher. Uh, he's a man who's been in this church since he was four years old. Uh, he is, I'm sure, going to be a blessing to you on some level tonight. So you come for 6 o'clock evening service. And then Wednesday night, you can come Next Wednesday, because we're not having it this week. Next Sunday, you can come at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Stay in church. Stay in church. Stay in the house of God. Don't be a Christmas and Easter type of person. Come every week and let the Lord use that to help you. Let's stand and have a word of prayer.